All right, welcome to another special interview edition of I Only Listen to 90s Music. We surprised Stacy with our guest here tonight, the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Garfield Bright. Got his PhD. We're gonna talk, we're gonna jump into that in a little bit. I, I had his brother went okay. singing to, to that. Other groups shy, as me and Scott have talked about off uh, in our own text, small take away from Stacy of how everybody in middle school was doing uh, I, uh, If I Will Fall In Love Again at the talent show. It's got to be the number one song of the 90s for yeah. talent shows. You had to. Yeah. Somebody got to hit the high note. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the other one was DRS Gangsta Lean. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Wow. That's it. If, you, if your talent show, if you were not doing If I uh, Ever Fall In Love Again or... Um, or Cupid from one to no, not Cupid doing a uh, voice uh, to men song. Oh, Kudia Harmony in in the in uh, the role. Hard to say goodbye. Oh, in, in the, the role. Oh, oh, hard to say goodbye. <laughs> like that's it. It's hard to say goodbye. Those were the songs that were done. You know what's funny? We only did one show before we got a record deal at Howard University. It was at Crampton, and what we did was a whole bunch of boys to men covers. We sung <laughs> boys to men too. No. <laughs> We did um well we started out with um 10, 9, 8, oh. 9, 9, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Then I was like, injection, fellas. Injection. <laughs> and then we did um please don't go away from me. The jam. That yeah, that was a joint. That's that coolie out harmony. Yeah, yeah, everybody classic. had that. You need, yeah. you need to we, we did End of the Road. I, I, I memorized a whole little bass thing from End of the Road because of Mike. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then we got an encore, and then that's when we did If I Ever. Okay. Oh. And that's when oh. we decided to get a record deal because that particular show, it was at Howard at Crampton Auditorium, and like that show was like the Apollo. All the football heads, players, and all the New York dudes came there just to boo everybody. Like that was their thing. <laughs> And it was a yep. whole bunch of talented people. Eric Robinson, it was a lot of talented people in that show. Okay. And everybody was getting booed. We just got the luck of the draw to go on last. I guess they was tired of booing. And yeah, we yeah. got through our whole show without getting booed. And then they asked us for an encore. We didn't have any more songs on our little DAT player that we had to bring the up to on. So we was like, what are we going to do? And we sung If I Ever. And by the second chorus, the whole crowd of Roughnecks was singing the hook. And that's when we, we felt like, yo, we might want to try to get a record deal because if they singing our song, first of all, if they ask for an encore and they singing about a second chorus, we might have ourselves a little special song right here because that was our yeah. practice song. We just had that so we could practice our harmonies and our long notes and our crescendos and all. It was like our practice song. Okay. And whipped that joint out and um, we got that kind of response. We was like, yo, on the stage when they closed the curtains, four of us were standing there still in disbelief like, yo, y'all want to try to get a record deal? Like straight true story, and then so hold on. So y'all weren't officially a group group when you, when y'all did the talent. We were show. a group, but we just we were practicing so much. We never did shows. We just practiced all the time. Okay. You know? and, and so what happened? Okay, so we were <coughs> yeah. on the tape. <laughs> Darnell, Mark, Carl, um, they're all Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity members, and two other dudes, you know, were with them. They were five. The the, the main the, the nucleus of the group is Darnell and Mark and Carl. They were called Beta because the uh, Beta chapter is at Howard University. Gotcha. Yep, Howard. yep. Okay. And so they were just a two man situation. And then it was this big talent show coming up. And Darnell and, and, and Carl had been Beta doing, you know, trying to get songs placed. You know, Carl was a hell of a lyricist and Darnell was a producer. And they were just trying to get placements. That's Beta. And but this show was coming up. And Carl, I mean, Mark got into the thing. You know, it was a show full of alphas, a group full of alphas. And when Mark got in, he named his special. Um, shy, which means death, it's Egyptology, it means destiny in human form. Um, mm. You know, in Egyptology, they have male and female counterparts. Mm -hmm. Destiny is, is, is shy, and then Renanette is like fate, and together they make <coughs> a future, like a male female aspect of future. And so, okay. the, so Mark came into the group and named the group that based on the fact that he named it Special Shy, and he thought it would fit, you know, the group. But meanwhile, though, it was five alphas doing this fact, doing this, waiting, to, um, rehearsing to do this show. And so, me, I had got married real young while I was at Howard. Oh, my wow. Dad, my, dad claimed, <laughs> my dad claimed me on his income taxes, man. And then that's <laughs> my financial aid. And so I was going to my senior year and they just snatched my financial aid from me, man. And so look, I had housing left. They let me stay in my dorm, but 
I couldn't go to my classes my last semester worth of school. Like I, I had a gym class left and a, and a writing class left. Six wow. credits. Wow. And I couldn't Damn. And I so had six credits basis. So six credits basis. Credit. And, and when they snatched it, like my only recourse was to try to get a 4.0 to get a trustee scholarship. That was like my angle. Like, oh, damn. Because I didn't have a loop. So I got that 4.0. It was the first 4.0 I ever got in college. Like I, that semester, I made it. <laughs> and because I was in the nation at the time, I had made a lot of enemies. I ran for Howard University student body president as Garfield X. And we ran against the, um, the, the uh, NAACP representatives on campus. And a lot of the teachers kind of like hated on me. They didn't like, mm -hmm. like me because I had the Farrakhan situation. Uh. And hold so on, so you was in the, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's rewind back. You was in, yeah, the, was nation. in the nation. I was in the nation. When I lived like 10 lives, bro. Um, it was in the nation. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Garfield X. you my little story for Garfield Howard? Like, X. Yeah, it was Garfield X, man. I was selling final calls. I was, um, wow. at first I started off in this group called Black Neo Force, which is like a paramilitary site. We might ourselves after Black, um, Black Panther. Matter of fact, the first and second hip hop conferences, um, were done at Howard University because we took over the A building and got this dude named Lee Atwater from being on the board of um, trustees. Um, he was a KKK member and they thought the students were apathetic and didn't know any better, but we galvanized our forces. A crew of us met behind the School of Engineering building. We had the schematics for the um, A building, the architectural design schematics. And we hang, came up with a plan. We made sure we roped off and made accessible the mail part because we knew that that was federal and they can bring in the national, like we were thorough. We took over the A building for like five, six, seven days. They, they tear gassed us out finally, but we got our demands met. And um, Lee Atwater was not on the board of trustees. And so from that momentum, the heads of that group, Raz Baraka, who was now mayor of Newark, New mm -hmm. Jersey, April Silver, who was like all kind of stuff. Like she was like, I think DMX is publicist, like everything, she's just this dope female. and. Um, they ran for Howard University student body and won because where hip hop was at that time was real revolutionary, black medallions. Mm. It was just, a, it was about that. And so they wanted their leadership to reflect that energy. So those two reflected that energy. And right around that time was when Public Enemy was strong and coming out and Spike Lee um, with the movie, um, you know. Do the right um, thing. Love, do, do the right Spike thing. Out. Yeah, <laughs> do the right thing and come out. And, um, and all that energy was around and that spawned the first and second, the first hip hop conference 30 years ago, basically this month um, at Howard and that leadership. And so we, they deployed me to run for liberal arts vice president first and I won. And so, you know, we commanded like a $50,000 budget. And then mm -hmm. I ended up joining the nation off that energy. I, I, you know, I was like really intrigued by that style, you know, black entrepreneurship, owning your own, accepting your own, being yourself the teaching, the being an FOI, like it was a crack era in DC. Mm -hmm. And at one o'clock in the morning, we was going to all the different projects, holding it down, drug dealers shooting at us because we messing up their flow. But we trying this to- This the Rayful Edmonds era? This the Rayful Edmonds era or right Rayful after Edmonds that? and Alpo was coming down. Alpo, Alpo. I was like, Alpo was right yeah. after that, right. All that going on and on and on. And so a lot of young brothers was getting their money, but a lot of people was dying and suffering for it. Like I lived across the street from this place called Clifton Terrace in DC. And um, man, it was a lot going on there. And I used to, used to patrol that, but yeah, I was in the thick of it. And um, you know, I was trained FOI and the whole nine, my number four, Kendall's worth and everything. And so then, but I was always like, the nation of Islam started getting government contracts, believe it or not, like Minister Farrakhan, because our security was so thorough. Right, the FOI ain't no joke. The government <laughs> buildings downtown was wanting us to be their security. They, they was like, forget all that Farrakhan stuff. These dudes, they affected. And we didn't carry any weapons, of course. We had no guns. And so because of that, we were making a big pivot. And I was like this fresh Howard University student while I was in the nation. They wanted me to be the site coordinator over at the cable building. All cable buildings are federal property. So they didn't, they wanted, you know, a lot of the brothers in the nation come from a real grind, grinded up, mm -hmm. hardcore. You know, mm -hmm. I was kind of a fresh face, a college student type. And they wanted me to kind of be the leadership over there at that building. And so I had a lot on my plate. I was married. I was managing grown men. It's like 12 men were under me. Like, you know, I was like 22 years old, 21 years old. And I had, and so all that was weighing on me. And I was, you know, I ran for Howard University student body. You know, it was like stuff going on so much. It was hard for me to handle my load. So I had to go to the, to the, um, to the you know, um, minister, um, brother Aleem, Abdul Aleem Muhammad and brother Tim, who was at that time, the, um, the, um, the captain of the FOI and let them know, look, I never quit anything. But this, you know, the main thing, me going to Howard was to finish what I started. And this is precluding me from really, you know, at this age, doing what I came to DC to do. Like, 
So that's in that lay, you know, they was like, yo, brother, lay back, do what you gotta do, man, because of your education, you know, this is special, you need to do what you and that energy took me to just be hanging out with Darnell. He was my roommate freshman year. Has since then he had, as I went to the nation, he went and pledged out for it. We reconnected. He was over in Fine Arts building six hours a day. I didn't have no job. I was working at the temp agency. I only had housing. Mm -hmm. I was going through it. I couldn't be in school, but so I just was hanging out with him in Fine Arts, watching these five dudes alphas practice for this big talent show. Two days before the talent show, two of the dudes quit. They were scared. <laughs> they didn't want to get, they knew it was, it was real hostile. It was just like their problem, man. <laughs> And so they quit. Now I had been just hanging out with D for like maybe like five weeks of them six hours a day in the bottom of fine arts, practicing. If I ever acapella, comforter acapella, baby I'm yours acapella. Oh, so hold on. So all those songs were already written? Yeah, they they oh. Darnell had written those songs before I even got into the group. Well, before I did this show with them, those there was a, those were just practice songs. Those were songs that they had written. Wow. One wow. Day, but really, they were like to get the vocal chops good because it's certain parts of those songs where you got to hold the harmonies out. They got yeah. the different, you know, fifths and you know, different harmonies. And so I had been watching this for weeks. And so when the dudes quit, they went from five part harmony to just three part harmony. And they had to have mm -hmm. at least four part harmony people with boys the men songs that they was gonna do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yo, G, man. Darnay was like, yo, G, I know you know the bass. You've been here all this time. I know you know the bass. I was like, all right, you know what I'm saying? I know the bass, but I'm, you know, I'm fresh coming out the nation. I ain't even thinking about singing and being in those show. But I used to always sing with him freshman year to the girls because Darnell's dad, Darnell came from, um, remember Joe Clark, the East Side High School? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And Patterson Darnell went to that school and those dudes riffed that sung in the bathroom. Darnell's dad. Not only was he the counselor or social worker for the school, but he was their manager, Riff. Oh. So we do all of their songs before they came out <clears throat> back in those days. And we used to go to the adjacent dorm and sing them songs to the girls uh, hanging off their balcony. And they didn't know it was a song that was already out. That it was already out yet. He was about to be out. We were singing all these little songs. Giving yeah, them a sample. Up, <laughs> up. And so Dean knew I could sing a little bit from that. And so, um, so when this situation happened, I covered down next man up type of thing. Damn. My dad is cute, but they was so I couldn't pleasure that, and that's why I ended up going into the nation. And um, so, so I joined them for that show, and I just thought I was gonna play the back, you know, I was gonna help do the little four part harmony, but I was just, you know, I was gonna, you know, yeah, I was the support. Had no, I had no fat, I couldn't fathom or even think about one day being in some record deal situation. I, that was not an aspiration of mine. I was. I was an educator. I worked on Capitol Hill for the Senate Judiciary Committee. I was a political science major. You know, I was about my books, man, to be honest with you. And I played basketball. Um, my team, Brockton High School, Brockton, Massachusetts, we was ranked number 22 in the nation by USA Today. You know, I had scholarship offers to play ball. I had a 38-inch vertical, you know what I mean? I thought, you know, I was a ball player. So, you, so are, you, are you from Boston originally? Originally, I was originally, grew, I was born in Nashville, Tennessee. That's what I thought, okay, yeah, yeah, But yeah. I never, I didn't stay there. Like, I was born in my Harry Hospital in Davidson County. I remember that. And then my parents moved to Knoxville. And when I was six years old, they moved to Alabama, Montgomery, oh, wow. as a matter of fact. Oh, and man. they worked at Alabama State University. And my first and third grade was on the campus of Alabama State, like they had an early childhood, early childhood education um, program that was off the charts to be a black school, and they mm -hmm. had a school there that all the professors sent their kids to and stuff. And I was in that school, and um, you know, doing my so. I, and after school, I was the kid like when the football game was going on, you'll see me on the sideline throwing the ball with the quarterback. Right. Or when the basketball <laughs> game was going on, I'm the kid sitting on the bench with the team and being on half on the court during halftime. I ain't had no business playing little ball on the court. Nobody else could get on the court, but they'll see this little kid out there shooting better than me. I was that <laughs> kid, whatever. My best friend's mom was a track coach. You know, I was that kind yeah. of, so I saw black college people all my life. I just thought that was what you're supposed to do, go to go to college. Like, I never thought that that was a thing that you wasn't gonna do. Every black person went to college, right? That's how yeah. I thought. So yeah. when it was time for me, I, I knew I was going to college. And I only applied to Howard. Like, I, didn't, I only wanted to go to Howard. Like, all those scholarship offers, all that. My dad made the mistake. He worked for the National Education Association. And in my 11th grade, during spring break, he had this big, big, big meeting in DC. He was like, yo, you wanna go to DC with me? Yeah, you know, it was cold <laughs> as hell up in Boston. And yeah, I'll go to DC, but it was still cold in DC. Right. But I went there, <laughs> dropped me off at the, um, fine, the steps of the Fine Arts Building like around 11.45 on a Friday. And I'm sitting there just looking at all the history and 
All and then and at noon here to start popping. Twelve noon at Bell Rock, and them doors open, and all them beautiful ladies came yep, out. Yep, I already office. said it was popping. Like, Yo, I'm coming to Howard. Oh, I didn't write a letter to nowhere else. I I did pretty. I got at, back in those days. I got a. I barely got a thousand on my SAT, and that was good enough to get like a, a acceptance for Howard. So I got accepted into Howard. If I didn't, I wouldn't. I would have had to sit out for a semester because I didn't apply nowhere else. <laughs> I came to HU and met Darnell my freshman year. We were both seventeen, and you know that. And like I said, then that show finally came, and we. My goal was to not get booed. Like that was the only <laughs> thing. I, like and as we went through our set each time, each song, we didn't. Because I'm telling you, like some of the dopest performers were on that show, and they all was getting booed. Just not because they was whack, because they was dope. Like Eric Robeson. He was singing. Yeah. Um, the first time I heard um, Pretty Brown Eyes was from that. I didn't even hear Make a Dishes version yet. That's how I knew it was. Oh. He was singing it and killing it. I was like, yo, because he could write songs. I thought he wrote that. And he was mm. blowing it down. And then all of a sudden, it was, boo. I was like, oh, y'all bloody. <laughs> and then um, Sean Allen, Debbie Allen's niece, was up there singing. She used to sing all the national anthems for the Howard football game. And she ended up being assigned this group called Pure Soul. They were signed to MCA. Yeah, Pure yeah, Soul. Yeah. They were on some song down, like killing some song. Hey, uh, what was that Pure Soul song? Uh, but we must be in love. love. We must be in love. Wind, <laughs> wind song. Something like that too. I was in one of their videos. It was crazy. <laughs> but they, but she ain't got boo. And then my boy, um, an MC who did the song on and everywhere that my crew go, um, Tracy Lee. Lee. Tracy he, Lee. Um, yeah. He got yeah. this dope song about um dorm life, like called. Creeping, um, you're creeping, you're creeping. Every and they booed him too? They just booed people because they was drunk, it was Friday yeah. night. It was like, they wanted to be the Apollo so bad. They didn't hear what people was doing. They didn't care if he was dope. They just wanted to boo something. And so they booed them. So we was coming on, like I said, my goal was like, yo, I am not feeling getting booed. I'm not trying to get booed. And it was a hostile crowd. And like I said, we came out with the 10, nine, eight. And we was behind the curtains doing that, right? So the crowd was like, So just in case they boo, y'all didn't have to come out. Y'all didn't have to face the crowd. It was like an injection, fellas. And then they opened the curtains and we came out with all this energy, doing all these boys to Motown Philly back again. We was doing all that, doing a little, we did all that. And then we did Please Don't Go Away. We did another song. And then when we did End of the Room, it was funny. We hadn't got boo. It was a moral victory in there. I was like, yo. And they around and gave us an encore? What? Yeah. And now we like, yo, all our songs was on this that player that we was playing. Like, now what we gonna do? And we was on the stage like, yo, y'all wanna do our practice? You wanna do it forever? You know what I'm saying? Just, all right, let's do it. Ooh, da do 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 do. Ooh, the well, harmonies came in by that second hook. I'm, I swear, the big burly football dudes in the front row with the gas face on. It was like, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> we was like, yo, did you see 250 pound nose guard right there blowing our joint? So we was like, yo, let's get, let's try to go get a record deal. And that next week, we went up to New York to the avenues of the Americas, where all the labels at that time, all the labels was on that street. And we went in at like Electra, all these different labels, and dudes be on the phone smoking a cigarette, listening to us to sing a cappella, not paying attention, you know, just fun. Hey, hey. And um, we didn't get the deal up there, but when we came back, WPGC Radio in DC had a softball, you know, they used to play baseball games with the community at like parks and stuff. We gave them a demo, they loved it. They put it on this new thing they had called Home Jams, and it was just start, it started blowing up. And off the strength of that, um, we had made our own little acapella demo, right, to service the label. We gave it to MCA. They loved the song, but they were scared that it wouldn't get airplay because it was acapella. And it wasn't like Boys and Men, Cootie High, that was already known attached to the movie, you know, Cootie High Harmony. Mm -hmm. So they were like, some program directors might not play it between music songs. So they wanted, they gave us a demo deal, gave us some money to record a music version. And contingent upon how dope or not that music version was, that's what that was going to determine whether or not we got a real album deal. And so what y'all know is the music version was what we came up with. Okay. And as a matter of fact, we finished that music version, mixing it like two o'clock in the morning, we was coming out, getting in the car, I'm slobbering. And um, <laughs> we turned on the radio. Now we've been hearing our song in the studio all day, all day, all day. We get in the car, turn the radio on, and we get, ooh, and we, we so, so sleep. Y'all heard the acapella version it on the took, radio. It took a second for us to realize that that was on the that radio. That was y'all. hearing it so much. <laughs> we was like, oh, is that our joint? You know what I'm saying? And that, that was the first time we heard the song on the radio. 
and it was just kind of destiny. And even the label heard the music version, they loved it, and they were ready to sign. They were ready to give us a record deal, and that's how we got. Our, we had to do our album in two weeks once we got signed. You know, they only gave us two weeks to do that first album because they wanted to sell albums instead of singles for more money. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Luckily, we had acapella. If I ever, we had comforter. And baby, I'm yours. And we put that to some music. We made music around that, and that gave us some, some credible singles off that first album. And we did we created sexual and some other stuff. Stacey, yeah, that's how the, all that went, man. But I, was <laughs> thinking, I don't know. know. Stacy got the good good question. I know she she. I, I saw her jotting down about fifty different things. I, <laughs> I just was paying attention. So no, I was when you was mentioning the acapella. So there is a song called Yours. Yeah. Not yeah. Baby, I'm yours. Yours. Yeah. Yours. Me and three other people know this song. Like, I swear to you, I can bring it up and it'll be three people to be like, I know that song. I I've never yeah. heard it in my day in my life. That was and one I of my favorite joints. For it, all this stuff. Nobody remembers that song. And you can't find it anywhere. Yeah, it's not on Spotify or nothing. That's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Probably because of it. The label was mad at us for that. Like, okay, so this is what, okay, so during this time when Baby I'm Yours was out, SWV, right? Teddy Riley he did this Human Nature remix for oh, right damn. here, right? <laughs> and both of them joints was on the chart at the same time, the original and the remix. Oh, we like, yeah. And that was it the sure first was. time the remix was like a different kind of song from the original. Like usually yeah. the remixes would be like this dude named All Star might take your acapella vocals and just put another track up under it. But it was a totally was different like, song. They kind of re kind of sung it, you know what I mean? Yeah, hey, new so beat. We was, our, we was telling our label like, yo, let us, so yours was actually our remix to Baby I'm Yours, but the label was scared to put it out on the heels of Baby I'm Yours for fear that it might, you know, co- like compete. And um, like they didn't even want to put Carpenter out second. We had to like, we made a bet with them almost because, all right, this is what happened. So If I Ever comes out, we get separated from Black Radio because If I Ever went pop. Yep. Yeah. Immediately before we did any shows in the United States, because they had so many connections in Europe and Europe MTV and all that, they put us over in Europe immediately for a promo tour. So nobody knew what we looked like in the States yet. They just knew that song. It was blowing up on the radio. And so when we came back, the first radio that we went to was all like the white radio stations. Yeah, the top 40 so stations. We, we, we didn't, like, we was just in the industry. So, you know, we ain't know nothing. You know, we was just like, oh, that's what you're supposed to do? Like, then we started getting flat because Silk had just got signed right when we got signed, and they was hitting all the black radio stations. <laughs> Silk, they, they, they yeah. Keith Sweat had hey, Keith Sweat. <laughs> Keith Sweat knew what to do because he had ingratiated himself so well with black radio. They love Keith Sweat. Oh, they so still he, do. <laughs> still do. And, and you know how to play the game. You know, Keith Sweat comes from Wall Street. People don't realize he he came out of a Wall Street background. He wow. Just, oh, was, I didn't know that. <laughs> Keith Sweat, man. He, you know what I'm saying? So, um. So anyway, we just some college Howard dudes, but we started noticing that like, hold up, you know, that people is hating on us, but it's not even our fault, but they they blaming us. Like we supposed to know better. So once we finally caught wind, we tried to double back and go to black radio more than, you know, and then we start explaining it to them what was going on. And then they finally start giving us some love, but they were on the brink of not playing us because they thought we were kind of like trying to be a separatist, bougie thing. It's like, nah. So y'all, y'all was the first all for one. They was trying to make y'all yeah. all for one. Yeah, we weren't trying to do that You only knew who we really were. Like, for real, for real. I, I came from the nation. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, come on, B. And so, but once they met us, you know, and, and talked to us and felt us like that, you know, but our label wanted to put Baby I'm Yours out after If I Ever. And we was like, er, I, I was like, er. Because Baby I'm Yours, the acapella version, we used to play with the piano and practice. And all those chords are is Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On. That's that's Let's Get It On, basically. Oh. Let's get it on. That's the same as same chords as Baby I'm Yours. And when it's in mm. that form, it's soulful. I loved it. But then when we when we did the track to it for our album, they tried to first put us with a producer um, named David Way, who did Kissing Game for High Five, and he <clears throat> popped it out. His versions of Baby I'm Yours was way pop. And we was like, nah. So we had to kind of give the label a little bit of that because they wanted that. So you hear in Baby I'm Yours, you hear that. Mm-hmm. I hated that, right? <laughs> um, because it made my song that I used to love so much because it was Marvin Gaye. It made it sound pop, man. I was so yeah. disappointed. And they wanted to put that out second. I was like, nah, hell no. Nah. Because the people on the streets was telling us like, yo, I love If I Ever, but that comforted joint, that's my <laughs> joint. You know what I'm saying? Confident, I was like, yo, we 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 human products to our label. I was telling them, look, we humans, but we human products. We in the marketplace. We can talk 
ass products. Y'all should listen to us. And Comforter is the song that the people want next. I'm telling you. And they were like, look, you know, basically how that lady told LeBron to dribble. Shut up and dribble. Shut up and dribble. Right. Shut shut up up and dribble. dribble. They was basically like, shut up and sing pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah. Like y'all are dead wrong. We know more than y'all. And they was like, okay, okay. We gonna, let, we gonna prove it to y'all. So they let Comforter come out with no promotion, right? They didn't put no money. They gave us another cheap video, no promotion. But the pulse of the street, Comforter was loved. And back in those days, people could call up and request songs and make a dent that way. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all about the big consulting firms. It was right before that, where people can actually make, make or break you. And so Comforter, on his own strength, came out the gate and went gold as a single without no push. Mm -hmm. And um, they were so pissed at that. <laughs> and it went top 10. It went top 10 without them doing any, you know, like the record, the radio record, radio execs, you know, they get with the um the radio stations, do payola, do all they didn't do mm -hmm. none of that for comforter. They just kind of like cover was strictly the street. Let's see, comforter was like, let's see what they do with Straight it. Straight lives they fair, hands off, right? But comforter had his own momentum. So when Baby I'm Yours came out on the heels of Comforter, they had to do all the payola, all the different things to get it moving and cracking. And then we decided to do the video at Howard and that kind of put it over the top. Once we joined it, we had a black school. Because then people were like, cause I remember that when I, I was yeah. I was in middle school, I was damn near in high school and I was like, yo, like they, they doing it at Howard, that's dope. And we did yeah. that too for Howard to give back, to help recruit people to go to Howard to show campus life in the, in the context of our video. That kind of makes it more relevant and modern. Mm -hmm. People like, yo, I'm gonna go to Howard. They went to Howard, you know, we knew what we were doing. And so we did it partially for that and partially because the song was, to me, too pop, and that blackified it a little bit. And um, so they had to do all that money stuff, and because they had to do all that, they wanted to make sure they basically showed us who was boss because Confident organically was doing better without any money than Baby I'm Yours. And so uh, we did a remix to Baby I'm Yours, that yours piece that she was talking about. Um, we were in Florida, I was sitting on the toilet, and I wrote my verse. And, um, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? We recorded it <laughs> while we were doing some promo stuff with the Florida Marlins. We were singing the national anthem at one of their games or something. And we was in the hotel and, you know, I wrote, you know, my little verse to yours. Tell me what you need and I will make. That was my first time writing some, some my own lyrics and shit. Writing some lyrics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was able to get my little writing chops. So I picked a girl for the video because I was tired of seeing all the you know, at that time, it was like they want the racially ambiguous looking women. All the light skinned girls with curly long hair. <laughs> and I wanted to make a statement like, yo, I want to set another tone of beauty. We came from Howard with all 16 shades of blackness represented. I wanted an elegant woman who wasn't a typical representation of what they thought beauty was. And I picked one girl for the video. And um, she was there and she was real classy. She was like real elegant with the long lines and she was even shocked that I picked like she was like oh I'm, I can't believe it y'all <laughs> I was like nah look at you you're beautiful you know so that video you know we did I think we did it in New York or whatever and um the label would not put that song out right behind baby I'm yours like a remix is supposed to come right behind so did that video ever drop I did, yeah, I on it. yeah it's on it's on YouTube it's yeah. on YouTube okay yeah. yeah but they did the label did not put that that song out until like this little remix album we did, like after the first album, we did like a little right back at you. We did a remix album and they put it on that. Yeah. But we recorded that thing to be the remix for Baby I'm Yours. That's why we called it yours, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they didn't, they didn't want it to compete. They were scared of it. And I was like, man, y'all are whack. You know, SWV and them, they doing they double songs, they charting all that stuff and they get black and black. They and definitely dropped the ball on that one. <laughs> so they were going on another joint we did with, with Jay Z. Um, that was just for the, I was gonna ask yeah. you about that. I was just, that was the yeah. next question I was gonna ask you about the Jay-Z joint. Look, but we see the reason, see that was crazy because okay, so we were signed with Gasoline Alley, which was actually a joint venture with MCA. A lot of people thought it was like a subsidiary, but Randy Phillips, big money. He um, ended up owning Red Ant. He ended up, was the man behind the last two for Michael Jackson. Like Randy Phillips was a major player and he was friends with Al Taylor of MCA. So. He decided he didn't want to do the label thing no more for a minute. They put us directly on the MCA. And um, we, um, when we were on the MC regular, on the master um, thing, Mary J's album was coming out. Mm -hmm. All these people who had already had, like, you know, they were next up. Shy was kind of like a stepchild on that because we was coming from over there. And so the Black Music Department had, like, four, three turnovers during our second album, Blackface. So we never had any continuity. So we was like, look, we're going to do our own thing. We went out 
and um talked to Marley Maul, Hot 97 DJ at the time. And we um we was like, yo, we want to do, you know, or we want to do a, 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 um, a remix to um, I Don't Want to Be Alone off of our Blackface album. Um, so we, you know, I Don't Want to Be Alone was our second single after Come With Me. And we want to do another remix like how we did with yours that wasn't just like the first, like the regular version. We want to do another. So tonight was the remix for I Don't Want to Be Alone tonight. And we went to Jay, um, Marley Maul, he gave us the track to, um, that um biz market that dun, 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 do, do, do. Yep, no, yep. nobody beat the biz nobody was like yo just... that's the track he gave us like oh shit. and so me and Darnell we wrote that one and um wrote a little clever little way and then we got the harmonies together how we want to flip it we don't want to do too much because we want to keep it hip hop and uh, we was trying to think of all these people who could rhyme on it and Marley Mar was like look I got somebody that that'll kill this. And at the time, Jay Z had just did "Ain't No Nigga" with Foxy Brown. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's what I was like. Yeah, he was like the poster child for like Hot ninety seven. Like coming, out, he was coming up, and he put him on it. Politically speaking, Marley Marr did the track. He's the DJ at Hot ninety seven. He put Jay Z on the track, so he got a message in the song just like we do. So he definitely won it. It became number one Hot eight at eight for maybe like a month straight. Like and. Our label did not do a video. We paid. That's all I was all. always asked. I always Look, wondered that why was not a video for that song? Because one, the black music department was turning over a lot. So, and they was putting whack people in there who really didn't know anything about A&R. Two, we paid Marley Moore out of our own pocket. We only paid him five racks. To, wow. For that you know, um, because they didn't pay for it. They didn't have anything in their budget. Nobody, none of them was going to get the credit for it in their mind. So they, it was kind of like this hand. We had a meeting with them to try to make them do a video. And this dude named Ken Harrelson or something like that was trying to convince us that the song was dope. We were like, we know it's dope. We the one that saw the people. <laughs> we know this shit's dope. <laughs> but they thought we were some RB, just RB dudes, and we didn't realize what we were doing. Like, bruh, come on, man, stop it. We went to Howard, man. We, oh, yo, come on. So they didn't put anything behind it. And in the, the, the hardest market to break a record in, our record was organically rising to the top. All they had to do was do a video with Jay Z. Like it, I so, yeah. that would have been super dope, man. Like a well, black and white joint or something. Up. Like <laughs> we kept getting caught in these weird situations like that. That it just never like they would never let us be who we were. Like it just kept happening. And this they wanted to keep y'all in the box. <laughs> yeah, it was just a weird set of sequences. They want y'all be all for one. No, like I said, yeah, oh, really, that's what they wanted. And then they was mad that I wasn't like. They didn't I know you was in the nation when they picked you up. They was like, yeah. Hold on, man. I had it all on the credits, you know, shouting out Minister Farrakhan. And all oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, they was trying to get you out of there, dog. <laughs> <laughs> I sang an album Blackface for a reason. Like, we was trying to reverse that whole Blackface thing that Al Jolson and all them did, you know, and inside your own face is a Blackface. And oh, uh, they, our first album cover for Blackface was supposed to be these pharaohs um, inside of a cave <clears> with a candle with a flame. With a with a stone is peeling off, and you see our faces, flesh coming out the um stone as human hieroglyphs. Oh wow! Oh. The edge of, they didn't want that. In. They stopped that image halfway. Through. Like we were just doing too. We were about to be hey, hey, up in that like joint. Like too deep. <laughs> the shot was an Egyptian name, and so they knew what that was. They knew what we were. They knew what we were doing. You know what I mean? And they didn't want us to represent like that. Like so, they try to keep us as neutral as possible. They didn't even want us to use our hieroglyphic spelling for shot on our albums barely. Like. They didn't like, they wanted people to think it meant bashful. And so uh, it was just a lot of that. We was, just, you know, it was just a lot of that, man. But I survived. <laughs> Stacy, go ahead. Stacy, go ahead. I was saying, like I was saying, cause they were like, can you be less black? Yeah, pretty much. That's what they wanted. To, that's what they wanted. They, and I want to get to that on the, the first album cover. Cause you just look pissed right there with them shades on. Like, hey, <laughs> you know, you know what that really was? I wasn't pissed. I was like, okay, so. <laughs> this is our first time out the gate, and I knew how the sharks were going to be in the industry. Yeah. I wasn't quite comfortable with being in the group yet, like in terms of being out there, because I was coming from the nation where it ain't no eyes. It's a whole bunch yeah. of situations. So I okay. didn't want to shine like that. I didn't want to be like the, I didn't want to be the dude that everybody fixated on and, you know, and then trying yeah. to separate. So I just hid. I hid yeah. myself. <laughs> On the inside, you can see we had these little model kind of like dope photography pictures where each person could be seen on the inside when you open up the CD. But on okay. the cover, I just had the hood on the shades. I <laughs> kind of like yeah, he looked like he was ready to battle. <laughs> hey, I, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, when, when I was when I was in middle school and it came out, I thought that he was on the run. 
Like, you know, like, remember how Ghostface <laughs> Killer was? Remember, like, remember Ghostface Killer at the beginning of Wu-Tang Clan? He, he, he wore the mask because he was on the run for a second. I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> snap. Like, which is the hardest name. I swear that's one of the hardest names. Yeah, it is, ever. <laughs> Ghostface. And one of the hardest MCs. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, man, I was trying to just kind of like play play the back a little more. Like I, I was getting front man attention too quick. I wasn't expecting all that. Like I never, I was never trying to aspire to even be in the industry, let alone all of a sudden we yeah. went from Crampton Auditorium to like singing on Arsenio and I'm singing lead to Comforter. And I'm like, oh, like I'm barely learning the word. I'm just, I'm just now getting the harmonies tight. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it was a crazy, it was crazy for me. So man. why why wouldn't, why not a third album? What what happened when we're not because of all the situation with the second one and it was just like we well, were done. It was par partially that and um Carl in the group, like when the like like I said, Carl and Darnell started off as beta, two man mm -hmm. group. And in that situation, from the get go, the whole point for Carl was he was trying to be in the industry. Darnell was trying to help him through um writing and doing production stuff, <clears throat> but um and he was a music education major. But Carl really was trying to be in the industry as his own entity. So just so happened that that show at Crampton was so well supported. Um, that wasn't the original plan for Carl. That just happened to take off like that. And then we ended up getting signed because people loved If I Ever with the harmonies and we were singing it. And then they ended up liking the look and all this, the story of the Howard. But Carl always kind of wanted to be on his own, do his own thing. And so after the Blackface album, then he saw that as his opportunity to step off. He had got him a label, kind of little label deal with MCA, See Me Entertainment. And he was trying to, you know, do songs with different people and stuff like that. And so he always aspired to kind of, so at that time, instead of like sticking with us and having the third album, he kind of like went to the left and did his thing. And that effectively kind of broke us up. He knew the industry and the business better than us. So instead of us getting our real credit for, for like a lot of the written stuff, a lot of people thought Carl wrote everything and did everything at that time. And he was a talented ass writer, no doubt. But the other dudes, Carl and, I mean, Darnell and Mark were the musicians of that group. They were like seriously the musicians. And I was a hell of a writer. I just didn't have a chance to prove it yet until that second album. Cause I came in kind of on the back end of what they had already kind of created. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it was just like timing and him, you know, and a lot of people fell in love with Shy, but didn't know the internal dynamics and stuff. So yeah, you know, just, yeah, no, because I mean, w w you know, it's crazy how you know you think back as a kid, like like, and you, anybody thinks about that any group, like yo, they 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 probably they rolling together, they eating at McDonald's all together, they <laughs> doing uh Burger King at the same time in the drive through, kicking it with people, and there's so many dynamics of people that uh, intricately displace people in different places. So that's inter I mean, that's just how life is sometimes. And I wasn't know? Hollywood, like I I I had already. I was confident in who I was before the industry. I was who I was going to be. I had, I lived two or three lives already before that happened. I mean, you was in the nation. That was, I mean, that's all you know before I mean? so when I got the <laughs> That was a fun ride. I was like, wow, I knew, I, you know what I likened that unto? That was to me like being in the bonus round of the video game where you get up and get all the coins, you can get mm -hmm. all that stuff up there. But it's a time when that part right there, you got to jump back down into the game, yeah. like Mario Brothers or whatever. And then back back in real life, and I knew that reality. We, I knew what that was while we were in it, I, and I loved it while it happened. But I, I didn't no way, shape, or form ever believe that that was real life. Like, and so it didn't define me. You know what I mean? I still trip out on how people respond to me sometimes. Like, yo, that's crazy that <laughs> I got that in my life. Like, that's a crazy, <laughs> that's crazy. So, man, how did you transition to be going back into academia? And becoming a doctor, a PhD. Because that was that was always who I was. You know what I mean? I didn't, it really wasn't a big pivot. Like like I said, I grew up on college campuses. I've always made great grades in school. You know, and so I was on um, teaching. Okay, so when I start started really dimming, you know, I had I had a family out in LA. I had five sons. You know, two of them are twins. Actually, big up to my twins because they got Grammy nominated for some work they did with Post Malone. They producers. Oh wow! Oh wow! Oh, yeah, Tyreek and Garfield, oh, right? Tyreek and the twins. Um, they worked with Rockstar for a little while. This dude named Rockstar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, Rockstar. I heard, I heard they, Rockstar. They of, you know, they were two, they were two of his dudes. But um, so I was working at the Gap, man, getting my kids clothes because they was growing too quick out of them clothes. I was going, <laughs> and, and I was also going to Cal State Northridge at that time. And I met this um, woman who was the head of African American Studies over there. She was starting this class called the Politics of Hip Hop, and she knew that she had to come with some kind of mechanism by which to create engagement. For political science because kids wasn't just feeling political science just off, off the cuff 
Mm-hmm. And she wanted me to help design or strengthen the class a little more, knowing that I was in the industry and I was a hip hop head. And um, so I, I did that and we ended up making this journal, an organization called the Hip Hop Think Tank. And we had a journal called the Hip Hop Think Tank dealing with all issues on the landscape of hip hop from misogyny to just all kinds of different things. And it was a sexy issue in academia at the time. Tupac had died, hip hop was becoming, Nas um, had Illmatic out, scholars were doing all kinds of research on Illmatic. And so there was a conference in Atlanta called the um, NCBS, National Council of Black Studies had a conference. And so we got to go present works from our thing. They like what they like my presentation style. They like what I did. And they were like, yo, bro, if you ever want, you come through this way, we get you in a master's program in African-American studies over here. Um, just let us know. I was like, dang, you know, I might, <laughs> I put that number in my pocket. Like, right. But I went back to Cali. I was teaching the day I graduated from Cal State Northridge because I had to go back to school because I never did them six credits. Oh. Turned, they turned into 33 credits by the time I went back. To, the, they changed the major in terms of what you had to do. So I ended up having to take three more semesters from six to 33 units. But it was cool. I made a 4.0. And the day I graduated, I got hired as a high school teacher at an environmental charter high school in Cali. So I had a job that day. And wow. I, but I went to the interview that day and got hired. And so I taught for two years there. And then after two years, I was like, you know what? I'm going to call them up on this offer, this African-American studies thing, see what they're talking about. So top Dr. Charles Jones, you know, they, they, they brought me over there. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I had a whack, um, uh, uh, the GRE school, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I had all these other compensating strengths. So they put me on, they gave me the thing. And um, when I, I did my um, my master's thesis, like we didn't do a portfolio. We actually had to do research. We did the, I did a master's thesis on what exactly is African-centered education. And um, I did interviews and I did observations. And I got the Asa Hilliard Award for the best master's thesis coming out that program. And so I just kept going since it was education centered, I went to the PhD program at Georgia State in educational policy studies. And um, I got put on um, there I'm in the first program in master's, I had a 4.03 GPA. And then my PhD program, I ended up with a 4.03 GPA. But my dissertation ended up getting the best dissertation award coming out of that situation. And, and my dissertation focused on how black males navigated inequitable power spaces. And I looked at classrooms, black males in classrooms, and black males in the music industry. And three of my um, my um, participants, one was D-Dot, Derek Angeletti, you know, the mad rapper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mad rapper. <laughs> Tracy Lee was another one. And my man, I killed an MC from a group called Jurassic Five. Out of, um, oh, yeah, 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 Jurassic Five, yeah, Jurassic Five, those, yeah. Those were three. But I also, they and I, because I had to have, they had to do four interviews, um, they stuck with me. Other people who I initially had, was Stick Man from Dead Prez and Killer That's Mike. That's guy, Stick, oh. Stick, yeah. I had Killer Mike and Stick Man, but they couldn't commit to doing them four interviews, so I couldn't keep going with them, so I had yeah. to pivot. But that's what it was gonna be. But um, the, it was a se- successful dissertation. It was really both sides of myself I was talking about, zipping that up. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I was always a scholar in that way. I've always been real curious and, and critical thinking oriented, coming out of Howard, especially during the golden era Hip hop and R&B, doing the crack era, doing Reagan era and Bush, doing AIDS at its beginning, yep. doing all these different things. You know, Spike Lee movies coming out and prolifer- prolif- proliferating the audience and prolif- being prolific in the music. Um, I mean, the film industry setting the tone for us. Um, all of those things hitting us, and then music being what it was at that time, just coming from all angles hitting us. You know, mm-hmm. like our party music was Rock Kim talking about. With knowledge itself, there's nothing yeah. I can't solve in 360 degrees. I revolt like public enemy, you brand new being slowed down, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Big Daddy King, you know, all these five percenters spitting like you know, five percent knowledge on us and stuff like that. But that was our party music at the same time, so we was made out of that, like, yeah, we was just made out of that, you know what I mean? So, you know, I carried that tradition on KRS One, you know what I'm saying? Like, black cop, black cop, all the songs, my philosophy, everything. So, we were just. You know, I was that guy, but on the face of it, nobody really knew that part of me. They just saw the dude in shy with the curly <laughs> hair. He's always, I felt like ghost face because nobody really knew me. Knew they your real knew face. That. Yeah, <laughs> it was like that's crazy. So man. you're in academia now? Are you in academia now as a professor? Well, yeah. Or? Well, I end, so there's a couple of different routes you can do. Um, mm-hmm. which is, like a lot of people end up becoming a professor within it. And I taught you know, most definitely as part of my you know prerequisites. You have to teach something, get that experience. But I didn't want to be in the ivory tower in the classrooms, 
in that dislocated, I mean, I'm in the hood, man. Like I lived, when I was in Atlanta, I lived in a place called Carver Homes, where a lot of my students, because it was like dual enrollment, early college was going on. Carver High School and George Washington Carver High School, I mean, um, Booker T. Washington High School, went to Georgia State for three days out of the week. And a lot of my students went to Carver High School. That was like five minutes away from Georgia State. I lived in Carver Homes. Basically, it used to be a project it turned into these kind of cool apartments. But a lot of my students would see me in the neighborhood around at the corner store. They didn't know the, you were in a scene group shy, though. Yeah, they, I caught the bus to school and they, they knew me from that. So when no, I had I'm, I'm saying, like, did the students know, like, when you walked in, they was like, hey, man, this is a dude for shower. They like, well, their parents yeah, knew. Their parents, their parents knew. knew. <laughs> they knew. I would come to class and the video would be playing when I walk into class, like, ah. <laughs> you know, but um, but it, but I, I developed a cool rapport and cachet organically with them because I was living amongst them. They saw me at the corner catching the bus and catching the mall and the train. And so my philosophy, if you can, this might not work good for like a lot of women because, you know, they got to be more mindful of protecting themselves in certain ways. But for me, I was just in the hood. And so I developed programs in the hood at community centers and, and, it, and it looked at critical thinking media literacy, digital literacies, you know, they, they, they know how to film themselves and create their own narratives to create counter narratives. But they get to do a score, a lot of them was hip hop heads, so they can create the narrative video wise, pull the community on different things that they thought they needed, ask them what's up, but then they got to put it together as a documentary um, and then they got to put a score up under it. And so all these different things were parts of the project, a part of my program. And it was just real organically and it made us close. A lot of them still my boys and my home girls to this day now that they all grown up. And, um, I took that route. I created programs. Um, and so I'm working with a couple of people to get some programs started at Texas A&M. I'm trying to do a couple of things at um, University of Houston, um, Texas Southern out here um, with a couple of high schools um, right across the street from um, Texas Southern and, um, and um, University of Houston. I'm trying to, when the COVID thing clears up, I was right up about to get dig in. Because when I first got my PhD, I took that next year off to write a book that I had in my head. Like I needed to download. It was that's such a commitment. You lose friends, you lose family, mm -hmm. people don't understand the hustle. And I took it seriously in terms of what I did. They just thought I was just doing the shot trying to get a PhD, but they didn't realize I'm a scholar for real. So, you know, I was doing 15 hour days of research and people were like, come on, you're not really working all that time. Or, you know, like, <laughs> like they don't really, you know, they don't just see me that way. They really don't know me. I'm misunderstood a lot in those ways. But so after it was over with, I couldn't just totally chill because my brain was too active at that point. So I had this book idea in my head for 10 years that I've been meaning to write. And it's called Lotus 3013. And it's basically a combination of like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter and Beat Street. If you can remember that movie. Lord yeah, of yeah, of course, Beat yeah. Street, yeah. And, and the premise is like in the, future, in the future in 2013, hip hop is believed to be a white cultural invention, a white cultural product. Yeah. And all <laughs> the sociological things around that. And, I wrote this and I did an audio book that's supposed to come out next month. My sons that I told you about, they did the score for it. They did actual score for, for under my Ooh. software. So it, it feels like a movie and all that. So I wrote that and um, that's over with. So I'm about to put it out. I did some music. I got some music that I'm trying to put out, but later after I get the book out. Yeah. 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 I mean, but I just, you know, I, you know, and I got this show, this thing I do on my IGTV um, called Curiosity Collage. And all the things as a kid that I used to look at adults like, for real? Um, but I was like, y'all are grown ups, okay, I guess. I went double back on a lot of those concepts that I really <laughs> didn't take and really buy when I was younger, that now I'm grown, I'm gonna really go back and see if I was right, you know, you know, little things. And so I, I, I got a show dedicated that called Curiosity Collage. And, so I know, I know what everybody, especially like with the tours and all that stuff, like, with, like was, was Shy thinking about coming back to do like, touring and stuff like that because i mean everybody's getting back to together to, because of the it's the time period well, we never like, stopped performing like we took remember the group riff um one of those guys from riff had joined the group men of vision way back in the day men of vision uh, yeah, housekeeper yeah, housekeeper, yeah, housekeeper. housekeeper. So we ended up taking um you know and they're like I, we've been knowing them for forever you know like we knew them before we were shot so when we needed like when it was just me and darnell left in the group we got mm -hmm. Um, G Fly and Dwayne from Men of Vision to be with Shy. So that's who performed. Oh. And we've been performing, like, we never stopped performing. We've been on, like, this, this dude named Young Fly Entertainment had all the 90s groups touring for the last five or six years. It, was, it would be Shy, Silk, it would be um, Genuine, Cut Close. Okay. You know, we have John B. 
H Town, like the usual suspects of the '90s. We've been we've been, on, we've been on the road together all this time doing shows in all these different cities. So we never stop. We've been, I mean, mm. but the COVID, like our last show, was the day the day before COVID shut the world down, <laughs> we did a show in New York at SOBs with Christopher Williams. And oh. I, when I flew oh, back, the battle of the light skin, the battle of the light skin. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was a big homie, man. Hey, yo, talk about hey, not really knowing the person. Christopher Williams is not the pretty boy that you see him looking like. He, he is, ain't the brother from the bank. He ain't the educated brother from the bank. Chris Williams is for real on the grind, yo. He, no, no, no. I heard he's thugged out, though. I heard he's thugged yeah, out. Yeah. That you don't, he, that you don't want to mess around with Chris Williams. He's intelligent. He, he intelligent with it, too, though. He just he, he got mad game. He just one of them dudes, one of them renaissance dudes. But he definitely ain't, ain't nothing sweet over there, for real, like, <laughs> at all. You know what I mean? Please don't run up on Chris Williams thinking something sweet. <laughs> nah. This conversation has blessed I need you to understand that in a way. And I'm sitting here talking to Garth, so thank you for that. Um, you, um, it's funny that you mentioned the, the outreach programs that you started because, so I am, uh, I go to University of Arizona, graduate in 78 days, thank you very much. That's what's up. Uh, and I actually have a project due next week about media literacy. Oh. And so I like it, like, if you, I'm like, yeah, I got I need to go ahead and hurry up and knock that out before the third um but at that point and you were talking about controlling your narrative and my project is focusing on racial stereotypes in the media and how black people are portrayed wow. by the and how the uh, how cultivation theory affects people and how they see us on tv and then um going from there and just the media and priming of them showing us mug shots etc so that's the whole project so as i'm sitting here listening to you and i'm like yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about because that's what I'm about to do. So it's one, that's it's dope. that sometimes it's you need dope. like that little bit of uh to hear hey, something. Don't get it twisted though. This is the same girl that would come in my parties. I threw parties for like 10, 15 years where back where we from. And she would come in the only girl with chucks on ready to fight maybe potentially. So don't get it twisted with this. <laughs> <laughs> don't get it twisted with this professional <laughs> version of Stacy. Represent <laughs> girl. Because one heels hurt. <laughs> Um, in case there was a fight, exactly, I'll be the one that yeah. made make it to her car. You literally yeah. didn't want to be caught slipping. To be able to go, just you get to your car in one piece. <laughs> go to my car in one piece. I ain't got to worry about taking off a shoe. I just got to put. I wear a dress and chucks. It didn't matter. I love I'm it. Going, I'm, I bet y'all make it to my car. I love it. I love it. I love <laughs> I it. I make it to the car. Hey, I love it. I do. I do. And um, you gotta do. You gotta do me a favor, Stacy. Since you're in a, you're, you you got a media driven piece, you got if you don't know already, you got to go research Oscar Me Show. You just got to go. Oh, I was just talking to about somebody about Oscar Me Show. Uh, one of my best friends, I was talking to him about him. How we really don't talk about him. We talk about D.W. Griffith that did uh, Birth of Nation. He's he the that. black version of that for silent films for black people. He you know sure. what I mean? Like he was doing cowboy movies. He was doing you know all the silent film stuff that we don't even know about. I think he died broke. I remember when I researched it. Yep. He died broke. He gave breaks to the Nicholas Brothers, like all of the, yeah. all those black movies, Lena Horns, all those Stormy movies. Weather, Stormy Weather. Yeah, that was oh. Oscar show. But he, you know, he was the matter of fact, Birth of a Nation. He did an anti-Birth of a Nation. Yeah, that's what he's the one. He's yeah. the black version of that. He did the anti. -version. They begged him not to put that in theaters because it was so powerful. Yeah, you know I mean? Oscar and he he did the first black cowboy movie. Yes, he did. He broke a lot of barriers. He was from the Midwest. I think he was from Kansas. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, because my uncle put me on him like 15, 20 years ago. My uncle's a black cowboy, man. Like, he does uh, the he does the announcer at the black cowboy event. The rodeo. The rodeo. The rodeo. My uncle is the announcer. He used to be on, uh, my uncle met you back in the day. He used to be on Magic on Wait in St. Louis, the what? Breakfast Club. My uncle met you, him and Tony Scott. I don't know if you remember wow. the Breakfast Club in St. Louis. He met you. And he's like, yo, Marcus tell him I said, what's up? That's my uncle. Yeah, Kevin, what's my what's I had no idea Marcus yeah Kevin, what's his, my uncle? Yeah, that's not Kevin Kev. <laughs> no, no, not Kevin Kev. Kevin Woodson. I was on with uh, Tony Scott in the mornings. Oh, okay, tell the okay. Man, tell the brother man big respect. So man. every time, if you go to Tulsa to the Black Cowboy thing, he's the announcer. I live in Houston now. As yeah, a matter of he's fact. the he's the one in Tulsa for the Black Cowboy event. Black Cowboy stuff that happens here in Dallas. Like yeah, that's my uncle. My uncle's the I thought all those. My uncle's in Argyle. Wow, right. <laughs> what a nice guy. I'm about he's got the ranch, the whole thing. You come out wow, there, he's for real with it. No, 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 I'm talking about, and he grew up on the north side of St. Louis. Keep in mind, that's good. He, he had a dream, 
He had horses in St. Louis, but when it wasn't, you could, he just bought a crib, had a whole bunch of land, and built a barn in the back before he moved it. Because he worked for Tom Jordan for 15 years before. That's crazy, man. He was on the Tom Jordan Morning Show from 95 till uh, 2010. Look, oh. in the tradition, in, 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 to talk about Tom Jordan and join and bring Stacy into the situation, we got picked to be on a Tom Jordan cruise one time. That's the only cruise I've ever been on, was that Tom Jordan cruise. And I was in the middle of doing my master's. Um, I was doing chapter four of my master's thesis while I was on the Tom Joyner cruise <laughs> in my cabin, writing chapters and then doing our performances um, that night at like one and two of the morning. Because <laughs> <laughs> hey, they kick in the Tom Joyner cruise. <laughs> that, that cruise, look, I needed a vacation from that vacation. Like that was the, I, that was the dopest, man, I can't even, I don't even want to go on any other cruise if it ain't like that. So I there oh, is no wow. Cruise. We need to make a 90s RB cruise. Like, are, we, are we grown enough at this point to go on that cruise? Like I know that yeah, I, I had I was going this year going oh, for COVID. Yeah, yes, but like, is it am I grown yeah, enough? Like, grown enough. Look at Stacy, we 40 years old, Stacy. Yeah, we we yeah, we pushing 40. They had, look, they had all they had all genres of music represented and all parts of every day for five days straight. There was a concert going on. You got, you know, you got the hip hop joint popping off at two. You got the gospel thing popping off. You got the old seventies soul. Then you got that funk era music going. You got go go, like all genres of black music all throughout the day, every single day, at all times of the day was ah, a yeah, concert. Yeah. All right, was- man. I know we ain't got that much more time with you, but I gotta ask some tour questions about. Uh, I got two questions. That one is a hypothetical. Okay. One is like a real one. Okay. Hypothetical. If you had to build your tour right now with groups, wow. From that time, what would you build? What would the bill be set out, including your group? How would you build out that 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 uh that tour? Well, um, my favorite group is Mint Condition. Like you know, if I was never in the industry or being in the industry, I just Mint Condition actually was the only. They call us boy bands. They were the only real band. Man, they yeah. The band. They all play. And Stokely, the lead singer, his best thing he does is the, is the he's a drummer. He's a drummer, real, yeah. Real. Mm-hmm. But he can sing his butt off and write too. Um, but we already like the night the young fly entertainment, he was actually what you asked me, he was doing that. And we didn't have Boys the Men though, we didn't have Joe and we have Mick Condition. They was kind of they were so large and you know they own right, they had their own kind of tour thing. But I would I would put all the groups if I could make all the groups from the 90s be on a super 90s tour. I've always would, thought about that, like 12 groups. I would like, have that. I would love that. Do and, everybody come out, do four songs and get out. Four songs, yeah, get off. That. I would love that, man. You know, like some groups probably deserve a little more, like New Edition right. been in the game for. Right. They, yeah. they the godfathers of all of this. Like they are OGs to me. Like, you know what I mean? We might all be like around the same age. But they started when they was like eight, nine. And eight, eight, nine, yeah. So they the OGs, they would have to probably headline or Boys the Men close to it, you know, Joe to see. Those are the, they, you know, they did, they, they way did their thing, you know what I'm saying? But then the shies, the silks, the one twelve, the H towns, the mint con- uh, the mint conditions got their own name to me too. But just all of us, you know, the yeah. SWVs, the Jays, the cut closes, the changing faces, the UNVs, the the intro. UNV, the man. <laughs> I, I, I'm missing people, but a uh, minute large, uh, yeah. the rule boys. Um, shit, who is the who is the group that y'all was like, man? We don't want to go on after them. Um. Probably somebody like a new addition, to believe it or not, like because they just yeah. veterans in the game. They stage, they stage show, they, they professionalism and just knowing exactly how to work the crowd. And they just had, they just the OGs, man. They they yeah. learned from the old when they was out as young boys. They was with them real OGs, right. really doing that. right. and that's what they learned. Mm-hmm. So now they, even though they are age, when we do shows, you can see all that tutelage coming out of them. They got yeah. they got a real education in that, you know what I mean? They lived that for years before we even got signed, and then, you know what I mean? So, I, I would probably say them, because um, one time it actually happened. We were um we were on tour um and um was it BBD? No, no, New Edition. And you know that song um um when Ricky singing um he put the cape on. Um, Oh, if I forget yeah. about uh, 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 I see you cry again. Well, cry again, yeah. man. Look, we thought we did something. And we do our thing with If I Ever and Come. You know, we do our thing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? On that but show, they, they took it over with that. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you, Ricky came out. 
You know what I'm saying? Because you know I'm messed up. He had a little hands doing all that little, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the also, I knew this was BBD down. then. He had BBD pop. They had BBD Bro, on y'all. You, them dudes know how to perform, man. Them dudes is like, they, 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 they been, I mean, but they've been doing it for so Yeah, long. like 40 so years. Polished, <laughs> they are yeah, so they're polished, man. They've been doing it for so long. Like you, how do you go on behind them? They so polished, it's ridiculous. But let me tell you, a, a group in our era that's actually like we all are our groups are one of one. So I feel like they they all from SWV to Silk to, mm-hmm. to Shy, yeah, H Town. Everybody does their thing in their own right. But a group that I'm really, really, really impressed with, like when I see when I go to shows, and they they younger than us. Um, Drew Hill, man, that that Cisco mm. and the way that they do. Yeah, hey, you know, Cisco is a performer, man. man them boys, be, I'll be enthralled on the side of the stage, like. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they give my pop, man. I, I love watching um Drew Hill rock, man. Like I, I love them dudes, man. They they songs are all dope, like dope. You know what I mean? Like and, and Cisco be performing this shit out of them songs. Bro. Right. <laughs> he do, he in, before he go on stage, he gets into this character, he get his hair right, he turns hey. into this other thing, then he go out and be that. And then when he, when he leave, he be almost in tears. Like he be so like <laughs> in it, like he be method actor, hey. like, he carry or somebody. Like he got this different approach to performance man i respect i respect big time so yeah stacy scott y'all got any more questions no nah, he pretty much answered the one because i was gonna ask what songs uh did they perform in uh talent show but he said they performed uh the boys to men everybody in talent shows on the north side of st louis was performing uh shy if i ever call yeah. love again and I, I used to do it for girls on the phone too though when i was trying to like get with them like, i'd be like yo I, I mean, which I song sing. if i ever or comfort which one you saying no if, if i ever because my voice went, hadn't fully changed yet so it was like okay. the in-between state so ah, I, could, yeah. I had to get up that high and ah. that much, so i could i could play it off and then i would throw y'all's in the background act like i had my own background singers so I would, oh my I, god I, I, would have... <laughs> I think martin did something like that on the martin yeah, show yeah, yeah. Over the phone, <laughs> killing it. <laughs> Well, Urkel, one of them, one of them did it. Yeah, 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 in the background. That's how I used to do it. Every time I think about, every time I hear Baby, I'm Yours, I think about y'all being on Family Matters. Oh, wow. That was so much fun. Yeah. The funnest part of that was we we was playing ball in backstage during this, between everything with Urkel, we was playing ball with Jalil, just shooting, we had a boot on stage. He was back there balling, like tough, like playing 21, like it mattered, like. (laughs) So man, let everybody know all your socials, man, where they can hit you up at, where they can contact you and what y'all got coming up soon or you got coming up soon. Okay. Well, um, on Instagram, um, the Garfield Bright Experience is my IG. And um, then like Facebook is the Garfield Bright, or that kind of thing. But Shy um, on IG and Facebook is Shy Roglyphics. So it's S-H-A-I and then Roglyphics, you know. Yeah. Um, Shy okay. And you can find us on there for booking and all that kind of stuff. And um, me and Darnell just remade Comforter. We did, it's called a Comforter Redux, which is, it came out so dope. We added some things to it, but we didn't take it away from the original. Like we, we just did some different little things, but it sound, it's dope. We gonna release that. I did an acapella, I, I just learned how to do Pro Tools. So I did some acapella <laughs> things on Pro Tools. I mean, you get, your sons are producers. So you, you better be get on that. I know, I'm yeah. whack, man, but I'm, I'm just now getting to it. But what I did do, I'm creative. So I did tracks with my mouth and then I'm singing on top of it. And it's one I made, was this song called Indigo Child for all the Indigo children? If you look that up, who they are, um, I, I did a song for those people out there called Indigo Child, and it's, I'm gonna do a video. It, it's everybody I play, I play the song for it, it touches them like, and so um, I, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and do a video for that and put that out, even aside from my project that I'm gonna do. Um, so that. So what, what is the solo project dropping? Well, I'm, when, after I put the book Lotus 3013 out, be looking for that. I'm going to be doing more announcements on my IG, so come check me out on there. Um, okay. But after that, um, and I'm going to sell it through my IG. Um, that's my fan base. I got 7,000. 7, it's not a lot, but it's enough to be a followership. Instead of All you need is a 300. Um, is my uncle always talking about 300. Don't All worry. You need is 300. Don't worry. Never worry about how many likes or how many followers that you got, because those are not converting to sales. So, if you right. got... You got 7,000 people that are willing to rock with you, focus yeah. on them. Yeah, so I'm going to focus on them straight, like, straight from me to them. Don't do nothing. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go straight to them. And then after I exhaust that, then I go to Amazon. But after that project, then I'm going to go ahead and put my music out once I get back into the... And I'll be... Um, I'm a, I got um, I got invited to do a celebrity space tournament at the All-Star Game. So I'm... I'm, oh. <laughs> I'm oh, you, oh, so you going to you Atlanta to do that? You're going to Atlanta? Atlanta. <laughs> hey, that's a good look. That's, that's a dope. good look. I'm about to go do that, man. Have some fun doing that. When is the All Star Game? That's uh, uh, March seventh. March seventh. 
So mm. this weekend, fit, no, don't weekend. flip over no table, man. <laughs> nah, man, I, you know, I'm, 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 you know, <laughs> Look, I'm gonna do, do the right thing. I'm did y'all see the it. World Series of Spades on Amazon? No, but I heard about that whole phenomenon, <laughs> man, like popping, like it's I'm actually like, a comedic thing, though. But it's like, but it's not like true to form. But it, it's cool though, because it's a whole bunch of HBCU people. On there, just basically making up characters and stuff, though, like doing a, a space tournament. It's pretty cool, though. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Boy, the uh, space games we used to have in them dorms, boy. People stealing from the books and oh my yeah, god. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big money loss. Yeah, Stacy. I mean, this is for you. You have any final <laughs> questions? Anything? I mean, I know we bum rushed you. I got nothing. I mean, what are you doing on May Fourteenth? You want to come to my graduation? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from I, Arizona. I got, no, she's in Dallas. She on oh, you in Dallas? Dallas. I'm in Dallas, but my we'll see. I mean, we'll see if I'm in Arizona or not. I don't know. I'll be somewhere. Big A behind you. Yeah, like I. That's my. There you go. Like to represent. Well, so we'll. I have no idea. Like because of COVID, I have no idea if I'm actually walking across the stage or if I'm be sitting. There. I chose not to walk. I didn't want them to hood me. I was like, I'm. I got. I got the scholarly level, but I don't want to be one of y'all like that. So. Oh, that's really real. That's real. That's real, man. <laughs> So that's my, my spirit. But congratulations, Stacey. Big ups, what you doing, young lady, Miss. Thank you. Killing it. Love Thank that. I've been blessed. I, this is, I'm, I'm in so much Same shock. Same girl to work shows. I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> uh, to, I love to her with all the tuck and all. <laughs> <laughs> and y'all are dope, man. Cool ass Scott. Check him over there. I, 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 <laughs> I like that. All right, all right well, man, me. thank you, though, Garfield, man. I appreciate this, man. We all hey, appreciate you coming on. I had a ball with y'all. Thank you. All right, man. Stay up, man. Stay strong. Don't be a stranger. You know, holler at me. No doubt. Hey. No doubt. Peace, y'all. Don't, don't tell me twice. Say less. <laughs> <laughs> don't threaten her with a good time. Don't threaten her with a good time. <laughs> Garfield, what you doing? You watching TV? What you doing? Yeah, you crazy. <laughs> you, you know the snowfall come on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just said random stuff. You like waffles. Me too. You are ridiculous. <laughs> All right, everybody. Y'all, everybody have a good one. We appreciate it. Peace. All right, Joe.